instead of reinventing the wheel, only do the creative part where it's needed. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and it is my pleasure to introduce to our esteemed guest today, Natalia, a luminary figure in the realm of design and technology. As the co-founder of Archie, Natalia embodies a profound vision that reshapes conventional boundaries at the nexus of architecture and technology. Her relentless commitment to design excellent propels Arki's mission to redefine the very fabric of architectural creation. Transitioning from the traditional paradigms of architecture, Natalia now spearheads a tech-driven venture, pioneering innovation at every turn. At the forefront of her endeavors lies the seamless integration of AI into architectural practice, revolutionizing how we harness project data. Through her pioneering work, she orchestrates the convergence of artificial intelligence and architectural design, rendering project information more accessible and actionable than ever before. In this episode, we talk about Natalia's own architectural journey, her career as an architect, and now her new venture as an entrepreneur and startup founder. We also talk about many of the mistakes and the challenges that architects face in their businesses and why the integration and acceptance and utilization of artificial intelligence is incredibly important in being able to run a powerful architecture practice in the future. We also look at how AI is going to be used um, and Natalia's beta group testing that she's currently doing with Archie and the Wisdom Hub that they are developing. So this is a really fascinating episode. Um, if you want to be part of uh, Natalia's group, which she talks about in the episode, you can look through the podcast information and get in contact with her through there. So sit back, relax and enjoy Natalia Baka Eva. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high performing remote teams quickly and efficiently saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. Natalia, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Now, very excited to be speaking with you. You've had a very interesting and unusual career path. You're an artist, an architect, a placemaker, a startup founder. Um, your career has taken you in many different directions and all of, all of them in that kind of domain of architecture and supporting and serving the architecture industry. And I think today we're going to focus on your your most current endeavor which is Archie Digital and we'll talk a little bit about what that is as a as a startup and as a, a kind of platform for institutional knowledge for architecture practices so it's a pretty quite an important piece of kit or kind of idea that I think a lot of architectural practices are kind of struggling with problems where this platform could be a quite a powerful solution to but let me first ask you 
how did your how did how did Archie Digital come about and how did your career start to take such a interesting shape? A great question. You know, it's all about storytelling, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, I actually started architecture school pretty early. I was mm -hmm. only 16 years old and uh, I never 16. went. Yes, I never went to how art they, school. How, how did they let you in so early, so young? Um, so, you know, we finished high school earlier. So I'm originally from Russia. Uh, we graduated when we were 17. Right. But because I did not go to any art school when I was a teenager or a child, basically they require you to uh, pass very rigorous exams. And in order for me to pass these exams, I need to take a prep course. But that prep course was taught by university professors it was pretty heavy load. Uh, I was spend about nine to 12 hours every week at the uni. And it would be evening classes where we would get uh, to drawing, to composition, um, you know, hand drafting, kind of CAD style, but by hand. And that would be preparation for the exam. So I got to introduce to the school where, where I eventually studied for many years, um, very early. And, you know, it's interesting because it's a very relevant question for me because as a person at that time, I was studying Japanese. I actually went and studied in Japan. I was studying English and, uh, you know, my family, none of them are architects. They wanted me to go to, you know, economic studies. They wanted me to go to um, foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to study, uh, you know, I guess, again, Eastern cultures. That's hence the Japanese. And uh, this architecture came out of nowhere and uh, at first was not received really well. Uh, because design was seen as something not as fundamental. And then later on, when I elaborated and said I want to study architecture, uh, that kind of was received better. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, uh, I was always wondering why did I come around architecture? What was the kind of the calling here? And uh, funny enough, recently I was talking to my grandmother and uh, she told me a story that when I was a child, she would tell me that uh, she wanted to go to architecture. And that was kind of her unfulfilled dream, which I totally forgot about. And uh, she told me that when I was a baby, between, you know, five, like maybe around that age, she would constantly talk to me about architecture, about buildings. And I don't remember any of that. But I realized that on a certain level, maybe she program programmed me a little bit. And she kind of place that uh, thought in my head. Uh, then when I was about 15, 16, I kind of, all of a sudden that thought emerged again. Uh, seems like out of nowhere, but I think now after this conversation, I have a bit more uh, kind of understanding where this is coming from. So it, very interesting. I know that you spent some time in Spain. You're currently in Toronto. You've done some You've spent quite a significant amount of time as well in the US. And initially there was an interest in studying Eastern cultures. Mm -hmm. This is quite a unique global perspective on the world of architecture. How has, how has that kind of global perspective shaped some, some of the choices that you've, you've made in your career now? Excellent question, actually. Even coming to today's date, I think that what, what I'm working on right now, I came to realization about certain problems in the practice by actually spanning myself almost cross countries and cross practices and cross standards, right? And kind of seeing these repetitive issues that we as architects are dealing with no matter where we are in the world. And I think that part of the thesis that we are exploring today and what we are working on is that that problem is universal. We are mm -hmm. not talking about Nat Natalia problem or, you know, architects that I know. We are talking about some fundamental issues about business of architecture that um, sometimes we fail to recognize, unfortunately. So your career then, you've, you've trained, studied as an architect, you've worked as an architect in your own practice, you've worked for mm -hmm. other people's um, practice. Um, can you just give me a little bit of a, a kind of understanding of your key insights from being a practicing architect? And, and again, the kind of the, the context for some of these, the, you know, the, the kind of innovations that you're part of. So I've been here in Canada for past 10 years. Mm -hmm. My education is coming from Russia as a bachelor degree of architecture and urbanism. Then I studied a cross unit between Russian school and school in UK, actually London Metropolitan University. Okay, great. And I graduated with architecture and urbanism from two countries, masters. And then essentially I landed in Toronto 
and I did postgraduate studies. And that's where the realization kicked in because I was studying construction management and we would only talk about business. I was always inclined into design heavily, but I was always interested in tech and how mm -hmm. things come together. But while going through architecture school, I could never find, you know, outlet of those things, those things, because, you know, we would never talk about tech because everything's kind of self-taught. You know, we want to do things in Revit, 3ds Max, Rhino, you have to go and learn it yourself. I'm fully self-taught in all the tech that I know today. Mm -hmm. And the same about business, right? Like we never talk about price. We never talk about budgets. And that's again, going back to being in multiple countries. And it's the same problem. It's universal. We um, have a luxury of designing for, you know, between five to eight years, depending on the length of your education in this complete isolation and in this, um, you know, imaginary universe. And then by the time we arrive to practice, the, the reality hits. So for me, studying a bit of a construction management and getting this business certificate degree, I realized that there's a lot of things that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. So when I started working for multiple firms, I was very fortunate to meet great people and great mentors, but I always felt like there was something missing, that the piece where I can make my own decisions, where I can make my own, that's what I was seeking so design was there you know the nice projects they were also kind of like i had a variety of um, typologies in my portfolio so it was all there but at the same time i always felt like you know this decision that's coming from another person uh felt heavy on me so that's how through you know trying and moving between firms and moving between typologies i did everything from residential to healthcare you know very deep and clinical planning and then i couldn't see myself there Mm -hmm. So essentially, once I started my own practice, I uh, was feeling way better uh, in terms of decision making. And, you know, it was heavy responsibility and I'm a solo founder uh, in my architecture practice. So it was definitely a lot to take on. Um, but at the same time, I felt um, that I can be in control of my own decisions mm -hmm. and responsible for them. At the same time, so that was a good part. At the same time, the, the second piece of that equation was... Uh, the scalability issue. I very quickly realized that, you know, for me to grow architecture practice, which is, uh, you know, quite a legacy profession, right? I need to either hire more people, take on more projects, and basically, um, eventually I'm going to be selling my hours for money, right? Whether you're on a fixed fee or an hourly fee, at the end of the day, that's kind of what you do, right? And then I realized that the scale and the speed and the uh, kind of enablement for me is not there. So that's how I turned to tech and that's how I started exploring how can we create this um, combination of this pure design, our art and aesthetics that we are so driven by mm -hmm. and this technolo technological piece that is available for us today that unfortunately architects are not using and not leveraging in their day-to-day -day practice. And uh, essentially now I'm only focusing on the tech simply because, you know, startup journey requires full attention. Mm -hmm. But as an end goal, I see myself being in this extremely technically established firm where you can, you know, streamline maybe business processes, you can streamline proposal processes, and as a result, the design as well to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting that you say that about the kind of relationship that architects often have with technology and how we're not necessarily kind of taking advantage of what's there. And this this fascinates me actually because at university, I've always found that this is one of you know kind of the the, the great things that happens in university is that there's often a romance of architects and technology. And we see quite a lot of interesting speculation, experimentation, pushing the envelope, people building wild and weird imaginative things. And then in practice, something happens and we kind of go backwards. And, you know, I often jokingly say to many of the uh, clients that we work with or architects that I speak with, that when somebody s sets up their own practice, that they that's normally the point where they stop learning anything new about technology and we'll see architecture practices who they're using vector works for example just because we had somebody um we had jonathan reeves recently kind of training people on on vector works 
and we'll often see people using Vectorworks, but from 2012. And they're using the same workflow that they used 2012. Then they're using four or five different bits of software. They're not utilizing the 3D capabilities of the software that they're paying thousands of dollars or pounds for. And it becomes quite sort of regressive. So um, t tell me a little bit about, and I, and I appreciate as well what you're saying uh, of the, the kind of scope to make an impact and scale that, there's, that, you've, that you found more options or possibility in the world of tech is that right is that what you're saying yeah. uh yeah and ren when i say uh, scalability i'm not necessarily talking about you know growing this massive international firm mm -hmm. what i'm trying to basically tackle here is that we don't realize that the technology today gives an, us an opportunity to be a very small practice and very efficient one and design in a different magnitude and again i'm not taking i'm not talking about taking on more projects but rather um, streamline this process, the workflow, right? Exactly what you're talking about. Because as we know from uh, Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI, he mm -hmm. recently said, and I truly believe in that, that in the recent coming years, we will see a $1 billion company which has one employee. And that's essentially the type of mentality that I'm trying to kind of wrap around my head here Mm -hmm. where we are smaller practice on any project we'd like, small mm -hmm. or large. If it's a small project, we can apply so many details and be so in control of this process. And if we're willing to take a large competition, we also able to do that. But we're able to do that not because everyone, everyone now sleeps in the office 24-7, mm -hmm. but we're able to do that because our processes are so robust that nothing can break them. That's just blown my mind, that quote you just used there from Sam Altman, that, that in the future we'll be looking at organizations that have one employee and the rest is completely leveraged through technology. And, and these businesses will be able to be having revenues of a billion dollars or, or more. That's, that's really quite inspiring, actually, for, for an architecture practice to just to start to recognize what could be possible and how much fat there probably is in their existing workflows. And we, we often use a number at Business of Architecture, like a benchmarking number, which is the amount of net operating revenue or net fee income um, per full-time equivalent employee in the business. So it's the, you know, basically the amount of money that businesses bring in per full-time uh, employee. And that's a very interesting ratio because we often see, certainly with some of the very design focused organizations, is that they've got large teams of people doing a lot of, doing a, a huge amount of work, but it means that there's a kind of cap or a struggle to be able to charge higher fees. And we get this kind of implosion of a business mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's very, very difficult. So... Yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that and, and how it's kind of informed some of your decisions. No, I think that I just want to echo what you're saying, because I think that inherently being the profession that is not very high margin, high mm -hmm. um, earnings, kind of high efficiency. I think when I hear that people tell me, no, we don't have a problem. We just do things like that, like this, like we did 10 years ago. And I'm like, this is actually what the problem is because you think that there is no problem that, that everything is perfect so there is a bit of a, this kind of egocentric attitude that you know we know better because we went through this fundamental education and i understand there's certain merit in it we do study pretty hard and you know no matter which country i was at i was studying maybe two three times harder than my other uh, mm -hmm. friends who went to law school you know history any other profession right but at the same time, I think that we don't have a luxury of just kind of sitting around and just keep repeating what we're doing because we're going to be left out. We're going to be left out in our own profession and we're going to be left out as an industry. We will not be able to apply our skill and knowledge that we gain through these years of education simply because we were not able to recognize that things are changing. And instead of kind of looking in and only focusing on yourself, you need to take all these learnings and be able to look out mm -hmm. and be able to be open for these innovations and for those implementations in your practice. Because I think that 
when I hear that firms break even or they even uh, kind of operate in a loss, and then they don't tell, and then they tell me, no, we don't have a problem with efficiency, we don't have a problem with the server, we don't have a problem with our standards. It's just uh, being kind of numb to, to to what you have and to your day to day, and it's very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. It really is, and I find it amazing actually that often I'll in, I'll come across businesses that are in the architecture space. They're, let's say they're home design companies, but they're not owned or operated by an architect. And I'll give you an example. A few years ago, we had a, a client who came to us who had already made a lot of money in tech and they had sold some kind of um, software company, decided that their next foray was to be in architecture. And I find this interesting because there's a number of people that I'm coming across who are starting to see the architecture space as having a lot of potential and possibility as a good solid business, but they're not architects. Mm -hmm. And so he, he had come in and he had developed um, a business. He'd written a piece of software, uh, which was, which at this point was about 25 years old and it was an ugly looking piece of software. But what it did was it allowed him to go in and interview a client uh, and basically type in some numbers and this piece of software would spit out a space plan. Mm -hmm. And then he had a piece of, another piece of software that basically translated that space plan into some CAD drawings. And he had maybe 2000 pre-made draw, like an archive of, of ready-made drawings. And it was very, very easy for him to um, kind of create a full set of drawing plans and then sell them to developers. He was very selective. He found like a, a niche somewhere in, I think it was Texas, they were operating in. And with a team of maybe... Uh, it was, I think it was three people and they were both his children. So they were kind of working half time <laughs> <laughs> and he was bringing in over a million dollars uh, yep. a year. And it just, it was fascinating because it was wiping the floor with mm -hmm. like financially in terms of what all the other architecture practices um, were, were the kind of thing that I'll often yep. see, but that's leveraging technology. And it's interesting that it took someone who was kind of an outsider to architecture to, to start seeing that. And if as architects don't, don't do this, don't embrace what's possible, we're going we're gonna to get ourselves into trouble. And you know, uh, I have multiple comments here. Uh, a lot of things that you said uh, really resonates with me because, so first of all, today, uh, my co-founder is a software engineer. So mm -hmm. looking from a lens, from a very kind of new profession compared to architecture and how things are done in a completely different way. Uh, one of the examples would be when architects receive a project and they sign the proposal, you know, the scope is this big. And then during the uh, duration of the project, typically it kind of expands and sometimes explodes and scope creep is a real thing, which is not a lot of architects are good at. Mm -hmm. And the software engineers, they work in a way where they start with a large scope, then they time bound it, and then they try to subtract it to get to the essence of it and deliver the results rather than a drawing package or, you know, something that they produced. So this is just one example of how now this multidisciplinary team that we are in trying to kind of balance between the knowledge that we know about the industry mm -hmm. from coming from my side and then the software engineering knowledge, but in the same time, trying to level it, trying to find this common ground with first of all, this wealth of knowledge in architect architecture, and second of all, super rigorous framework and this technical, when I say technical, I don't mean code. I mean, technical frameworks that help build this, you know, mega companies and run them like have them run as a machine right mm -hmm. so this is one piece of it and then in terms of what you said about this uh, developer person and uh, you know kind of running this uh, as an outsider from the in not coming from the industry running this practice it actually doesn't surprise me and that is why now partnering with a software engineer i would never choose otherwise because i think that when I when we speak with architects and you know as a in the realm of our um, startup today we interview hundreds of people and I still do discovery calls uh, you know every day just because the the knowledge is always there I think what I hear a lot is architects argue that all the projects are unique and when I tell them 
we are building this corporate wisdom hub where you don't need to redraw something that you created in the past. And you can just go ask this all know it all person, this kind of machine, have we done this? How did we do it? And have a conversation with it. Sometimes copying details, sometimes just looking at the details. They tell me, you know, that's not going to work because every project is unique, but I'd actually challenge that. And I think this is one of the problems that as a profession, we are probably struggling with because it is, it's simply not true. Not every project is unique. And even if it's unique, you will still have some commonalities. You will mm -hmm. still have barrier-free washrooms. You will still have grab bars. You will still have foundation details that probably not going to be very unique, but we fail to recognize it, right? I, I, that is so, so, so key. And, it, and it's often a very common myth in architecture that every project is like completely unique. And it's a bit of a, la it's a, bit of a lazy excuse that makes, that in the end is really not that lazy because yeah. it, make, it, it makes so much more work for the architect. Yeah. So, so very interesting. So perhaps we could talk a little bit now about Archi Digital and and what it what exactly it is and what are the some what are some of the problems that it's looking to to solve um, for practices and the industry. And then perhaps we can talk a little bit about you know the the process that you've gone through in actually creating this organization and some of the the challenging challenges and successes that you've had so far. Sounds good. So I think for me going through Again, multiple practices, um, different size of practice, everything from four people to 250 people over four cities. I could see the same problem of um, architects who are individual contributors, let's say whether they're new hires or they've been in the firm for a couple of years already. I've been so many times in the situation where I would sit in my desk, I have a task that I need to accomplish in a certain time frame, and I would know, I would have no resources for me available. You know, the only resource, it would be my either project manager, my principal, or my direct peer on the same project, right? And then I would notice that, you know, I ask principal for reference and then principal would spit out something super quickly on their way to the meeting or something. And they would say, just go look at this address or project number. And they would tell you something that you not necessarily can just take as a data and input. You have to now go and search and you can't find it. You go talk to another person and then that person talks to another person. And then, you know, in some instances, it would even, even go to like accountant because mm -hmm. they couldn't retrieve the project number. They know the address, but they don't remember the project number, but on the server, it's all coded. So you don't have the project names, it's all codes. So, you know, 10 people after you end up with IT who now go to archive server and it's only read it read only so now they have to retrieve it from there and you know it's days after and we're just looking for one reference and by the time you arrive to this reference principle just blanked and it was a completely different thing mm -hmm. and <laughs> that happens so many times and like just looking at this as inefficiencies that everybody mm -hmm. just kind of running around and if we have already quite low profit margin, right? Like if we're on a fixed fee, we have our salary, we have our uh, overhead, and we have our profit, right? So by the time we are running around, if you imagine this is a bar, that profit is just getting squeezed. And it's just yep. it's getting squeezed to the point where there's no profit left. And then now you start eating into your overhead and we just starting the project. We haven't even mm -hmm. arrived to the middle or towards the end. What ends up happening is that by the time you're in your construction documents or close to construction, there's no fee left. And that's where everyone starts like pressuring, staying over time, you know, running low on resources, like pulling more people into the team. And essentially the quality suffers, right? And then we arrive to construction sites and pardon my English, but <laughs> look like idiots because we just we just didn't have, it's not because we don't know how to draw it. We just didn't have time. And we mm -hmm. didn't think ahead what might happen if we're going to be trying to think that everything is drawn from zero or trying to, you know, spend too much time up front just to gather the data. So after seeing this problem, I spoke to maybe 50 to 60 architects very early on. And 90% uh, of them told me themselves without me asking. To, so always I, when I do discovery calls, I try to um, not ask direct questions. It's like, what is the worst part of your day? 
what you really struggled, if you ever quit your job, why was it? And 90% of the people told me it was because I was sitting at my desk, have nothing available to me. I know for a fact we'd drawn it at least five times. And I would try to draw this concrete curb detail, soul, soul extracting <laughs> type mm-hmm. of work. Um, and uh, no one would be there for me. And this issue multiplies when you think about new hires, people who just come in out of university, who sometimes are not confident to ask the question. They would feel like they're going to lose their job. When we talk about newcomers, like for example, in Canada, we have so many immigrants who are coming from different countries and they're trained architects, but they not necessarily know all the details or all the language or the application materials and methods of of country here, how it's done, right? And you end up in this loop where everyone knows this knowledge exists, no one knows where it is, and we're just running around and like trying to figure it out. And the, the worst part of this, it's always done ad hoc. Mm-hmm. What is the value of hiring an architecture firm that existed for 60 years if every time they start a project, they do everything like for the first time? Then you might as well just hire a startup one person team. Mm-hmm. Like, what are we paying for as a client hiring this established practice? Mm-hmm. It is all the established knowledge is just in one person's head. And that's really very, very interesting. And, you know, the assumption would be from a client's perspective that they were, you know, getting a high level of experience or expertise on a project. And, you know, sometimes in, in the, the reality of it is on, when, you, when you're building these teams out on a practice that you're you know, you're using people who don't have that experience on it. And, yeah. and it's, and you're quite right as well that it culturally in architecture, this is all deemed totally acceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even the experience of setting up your own practice. Um, and I know from my own, my own kind of personal experience, I was kind of number one, there was a big kind of shock and horror at the lack of actual core construction knowledge and science that I just did not know and had not been exposed to during my time at university, which is there's a whole other conversation about that. But yeah. it, it, you know, and you know, I, I when I left university, I went to work in big large firms like Rogers and Grimshaw, amazing places, but I didn't really know how a brick wall went together. Yeah. I didn't really know anything about insulation. I didn't know anything about, you know, waterproofing and all these sorts of basic construction details that when you set up on your own business and you know certainly a a young small practice your first port of call normally is residential that there weren't any resources available for this kind for like you know where where are all these details kept you know there are you know there are kind of websites or collections but from other architects or you know i wanted to be able to see the details drawn from other other projects you have to you know they you, you can get them but I was often finding myself asking other architects for their details or for examples yeah. of drawings and kind of starting to build up my own libraries and was yeah. kind of just kind of shocked that there, that this wasn't an open sourced type of resource that yeah. was more widely available. And the amount of, you know, the, the amount of uh, kind of learning or reinvention that was that was needed to unpick a lot of these sorts of things whilst it was in a way kind of good for my own development as an architect it it didn't need to be that mysterious and yes yeah. and i can see this happening in lots of practices where that inf- that information just where is it where where is it being held inside of the business and um very good point and i think to build on that conversation about the historically low, kind of lower margin industry, right? If mm-hmm. we compare, for example, for with tech or even other some other industries, right? Um, I don't again. I don't think we have the luxury of even reinventing those details. It's almost mm-hmm. like in my head, by default, if we exist in the practice. We are talking about mentorship. We are talking about collecting knowledge. We are talking about building fundamentals and then building on top of them. Mm-hmm. We don't have time or space to not be using these details mm-hmm. or not be using this information. And it's almost like we are robbing ourselves of this time, right? Because if you done a template, if you preset something, then next time you're going to engage with the new client, you're going to save this time that you're going to put into profit you're gonna you're gonna 
hopefully either grow your business or start an adventure as a like experimental studio or whatever. Maybe you go home earlier. Also mm -hmm. good. You know, for some architects, <laughs> like majority of the architects are really guilty of, you know, not taking care of themselves. That's, that's a completely different conversation as well. But I think that for us, building this mind map, building this continuity in your practice, instead of um, reinventing the wheel, only do the creative part where it's needed. Mm -hmm. If the machine can suggest you a detail and bring you to 50%, and then you can take it from 50 to 100, why not? If we know the tools today can be trained to a level of sophistication where the tool can tell you it's a two bedroom apartment because there are two baths. It's a powder room because it's only a sink and a toilet. There is no bath. If it can tell you it's a terrace versus balcony because terrace has a different hatch on it, why are we not using it? And it's, it's not technologically, I can hear a lot of architects tell me it's not possible. I'm like, there's a software engineer sitting next to me. Let him worry about it. Just mm -hmm. the fact that people are not willing to open their mind and that's why kind of we're looking for these early adopters and there's people who are um, truly want to innovate in their practice, not just to say on their website that mm -hmm. they're innovating, but actually dedicate time and resources and part of their research and the firm to this innovation and stand by it because they see a bigger future for the profession. And that's very challenging because, and I ask myself this question almost every day, we are are as a creative profession we are so good taking a napkin and drawing a 50-story building and imagining the lobby the common areas how the the you know the elevator uh, lobby will look like the rooftop all of these things right and in our head carrying this heavy load but then when it comes to something as simple as business frameworks knowledge transfer imagining like this for example the software that we're building can exist we hit a bit of a wall mm -hmm. because, and I don't know why it happens because we are technologically challenged or because we are so wrapped up and there's so much responsibility on our shoulders that we are not able to kind of open ourselves up to this greater invent adventure, right? It's, so it's, it's so, it's so, so interesting. And, you know, for architects are smart people as well, right? It's a very intelligent profession where people with a lot of, you know, analytical skills and technical skills and ability to synthesize complex ideas and reside in the unknown, you know, and that's, that's all of this, this kind of mental thinking discipline is, is, is very intellectual and very, it's hard, it's hard to kind of craft it. But then the lack of thinking about the production of architecture or the business aspects of it, or how this type of technology can be can be implemented is just it is it's quite baffling but on the other on the other hand of this uh, one thing i would kind of say is that part of it is like a it's almost like a mindset problem mm -hmm. or a cultural problem that the industry has and just yesterday i was talking to somebody and we were talking about bqe core and and they were you know, I was, was trying to get some reports from them to show the finances that we could look through. Oh, I haven't got that sorted out yet. Um, I'm going to sit down at the weekend and figure it and figure it out. And and my first question was like, well, why don't you just hire? Why don't you just either pay pay for some training or hire like an implementer to come in and sort out the QE core for you and get it set up? And their initial response was like, oh, no, no, I'm really good at this kind of stuff and I'll sit down and figure it out. And I was like, I know that you can figure it out and that you're smart and you will be able to figure it out and you'd better do a good job. But you've got 200 other things to do and this is not going to get done. Yeah. And, and this is the world of the architect. It's almost like the, the challenge is being talented and smart, whereas an entrepreneur who comes in who doesn't know anything about architecture they have to hire expertise they have to figure out a way of getting expertise working to deliver something um with a limited kind of pool of resource as well 
whereas the architect will try and do everything themselves and solve it. And often they can solve things and do things very well, but they can only do one of the 200 that's needed. Yeah. yeah. And then the business starts to sink. That resonates with me so much because as part of our journey building a software, we also hear a lot from people. We, we already have Revit library or we are currently building our own intranet or catalog or like we have this thousand projects that now I'm going to put in PDF and it's going to be my guide. And I actually argue that they should do that because they don't have time or resources, like exactly you're saying. You are not able to run your software engineering team inside of your practice. And even if you hire software engineers as an architect, do you know how they can deliver the result? Do you know what the frameworks to apply to, to, to help them, to, to help you? Mm -hmm. um, so essentially what we're seeing is that when someone comes on a team to work on a template or you know to, to catalog the project, catalog the knowledge, they work there for maybe a couple of months and then very quickly the d deadline hits and all the resources being pulled from those activities, templating, library, and then they just been thrown again on the d deadline and then these people never go back and continue their work. So, you know, with Arkey, we essentially offer this service where we help you just identify what you already have mm -hmm. and not only identify, but catalog it, but don't catalog it manually like a lot of people do today. Catalog it with the technology. If we're able to train the machine to recognize architectural patterns on every stage of design, and then we can quickly search for those assets in our own internal database, why are we not doing it? Mm -hmm. If I have drawn 10 multi-unit residential buildings, and all of them are in the same location, and all of them would have one bedroom, maybe 70% of the building, would, that would be the scope. Why do I need to draw this floor plan every time? And I hear that they, there are people who spend four to five months to draw all the units in a condo, and this just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Because yes, there are gonna be some customization. Yes, there are gonna be shafts. Yes, the core is gonna look a little bit different. But 80% of the time, we can just do fit it. We can do the fit in of this unit super quickly. And the same applies to details. Mm -hmm. The same applies to graphics. The same applies to specification. The same applies to sometimes even your legends and some other pieces, right? Because people reinvent the wheel all the time at all stages, simply because when they need to draw something super quickly, there's no way for them to find it super quickly. Wow. I mean, the, 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 the kind of possibilities here of having a, you know, intelligent, trained, just a, like a decent curation system. I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of architects at the moment and a lot of creatives who are very fearful of AI. And my perspective is that you don't, then you're not really understanding what it is because it's not like you're going to be replaced by anything, but you'll probably be replaced by an artist or an architect who's using AI well because they're, they're yeah. using it as their tool. It's not, it's not something to come in and like, you know, remove the architect, yeah. but it is something that's, that's there to make your workflows um, just way, way, way more efficient. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned this because this is one of the things that we are not hearing a lot, but I think a lot of architects, again, mean it. Maybe they're not early adopters that we're looking for, but they are maybe a bit more like you said, it's a mm -hmm. cultural thing. Recently, I came across uh, this very large company, about 250 uh, employees, and I spoke to their principal, sit down, we sat down and had a very nice conversation about this topic of AI and kind of how it's implemented in practices. And, you know, uh, they have in their office a kind of user group where they pick the new software and they test it. And that's essentially the model that we are looking for to run, right? You find the firms who are early adopters. They have this testing, like almost like sandbox environment. They take your software, they kind of work with you, they build it, they test it, and then they make a decision whether they want to continue using it. Here, they basically started using MidJourney. And then the hype was unreal. Everybody was like typing prompts and rendering their projects and kind of like doing this conceptual design. But then very quickly, it all kind of died down. And he's telling me that we realized that it's taken away the most fun, the most creative, the part of the process that everyone enjoys 
where early on you're not bound to these requirements, you can kind of think a bit more freely, have a, a bit more air around you, right? Mm -hmm. And I so identify with the statement because why do we think about AI taking away the creativity when in reality, if you think about the way the language, the large language models are set up, the way the AI is, which is accessible for us today, is structured, is it's good at going through a large amount of data super quickly and providing the results, the answers, right? So that's exactly the philosoph philosophy that we are using for Archie because we are not trying to tell you what to do with it. We are not trying to mm -hmm. force you to reuse it, copy it, or like render it for you. All we're trying to say is that you have it, just find it, and then you decide what to do with it. Amazing. Very, very interesting. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the where you're at with the with the company, how long you guys have been going for, and what it's taken to even begin to develop a software platform of, of this kind of uh, innovation, if you like? Yeah, very good question. Uh, we've been working at this problem uh, for about four months. Uh, mm -hmm. We spent the uh, first four months uh, only focusing on the problem. Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, startups are struggling with or some companies that are early uh, not very good at is identifying the problem first before coming to a solution. Mm -hmm. It's not about, you know, ideas. Ideas are cheap, as we say. Uh, you know, I have a million ideas a day, but it doesn't matter if the problem does not exist. Software is very expensive to build. So if you try to force the solution on your user, it will never work. Mm -hmm. So four months we spent researching, um, talking to users, uh, identifying, fine-tuning fine the problem, kind of be very open-minded, looking at it from different angles. We were part of the startup incubator, so we did secure the funding to go on this journey and essentially we are uh, VC backed. Um, we um, raised the pre-seed that allows us right now to work and you know bring some help in terms of software engineering and also just kind of sustain the company uh, before we get uh, first uh, you know paying customers. In terms of the solution itself, uh, after we were 100% sure the problem exists and we were ready to build a proof of concept, uh, we jumped into solution space and that uh, led us to end of January when we released the first version of our prototype. It's not the MVP yet, uh, but it's rather um, a tool for us to deliver the value, to show the value, um, mm -hmm. to help architects who we are bringing on board as our design partners to understand what is the problem and what we are solving for them. Essentially, from this version, the next step would be uh, partner with those early adopter firms and continue developing the product together. Mm -hmm. So it's their baby as much as it's ours. Uh, we have a couple of firms we're already working with and we're looking for three more. Essentially, the spots are limited. We only can serve five firms today just because we're two people and there is a lot of work for us, two of us to do. Essentially we sat down for this brainstorming sessions every two weeks and then we communicate on the weekly on the weekly basis basis with them and then essentially uh we build the software we show it to them and we ask for their feedback the worst thing you could do in the niche environment like we are in to build in isolation and then try to force it on users mm -hmm. and unfortunately a lot of software in our space that's been developed are done this way so I actually argue with my colleagues that do you want the software to be done by architect or do you prefer a bunch of software engineers get together and then force it on you and you have no choice to use it because mm -hmm. now we are so behind <laughs> that we have to just jump on this, uh, you know, kind of last uh, train that is departing. So that's why we're building this very integrated, very kind of innovative, very novel project. We kind of see that some architects are skeptical. And that's why I essentially mentioned that being the early adopter mentality, not just, you know, on your website, on paper, but being early adopter in your essence, being able to allocate time to R&D, being able to show up to imagine how your life can be better with the software mm -hmm. and how it can bring value to you in the future 
yes, today it doesn't exist yet, but it's, it happens with every startup. You have to kind of get on board on a promise. And a lot of people tell us, you know, you build it and then we buy it. And I'm like, that not, that's not mm -hmm. how it works. You have to invest your time and your resources to show, to be committed, mm -hmm. to endorse us because you believe that profession needs it. Not because, you know, maybe you need it to save some money or, you know, to be more efficient, but in the bigger picture, that's mm -hmm. where we need to be going. And by jumping on board, you essentially almost signing this, you know, agreement with yourself and with the industry that we agree that we need this. Amazing. So if anybody's listening to this right now and they want to kind of um, be part of the, the beta group, if you like, what would, what would they need to do? Uh, they would just need to send me an email. It's natalia at getarchy.com. So N-A-T-A-L-A -A -A at getarchy.com. It's a pretty straightforward email. We'll put it all in the, in the information. And we are essentially, uh, we have 50 people who are doing the beta, closed beta testing. And they essentially give us feedback. Uh, we implement it and we kind of roll that way. Mm -hmm. But we are looking for design partners who are firms. So those people are individuals. And our goal to have endorsement from a firm where, you know, we sit down with them and they also take a piece of software and they try to break it in their own user group environment. Mm -hmm. And they kind of go back to it every day and they're like, mm, you know, I think this can be a little better. Maybe we implement this feature here. And, you know, through this push and pull movement, we move forward. Amazing. Very, very exciting. I love them just, just hearing about the evolution of, of the business itself and the kind of process that you guys have been going through and the fact that you spent the first, you know, few months just trying to pinpoint what the problem was. And um, I was listening to an interview with, what's the name? There's a, there's one of these Uber Eat style companies, the, that the one that, whatever the one that was that preceded Uber Eats, I forget the name of the, of the app in the U S but it was developed by, um, you know, four guys from Stanford. And they told this story of how they literally spent the first year interviewing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small businesses in their area, just trying to circle down what's the problem, what's the problem. And eventually they kind of, you know, saw that small restaurants were having lots of issues and that all of them wanted to deliver food or have food delivery services, but they didn't have the capacity to be able to, to actually provide it. And then that kind of, you know, so much work getting put into identifying the problem then means that, you know, it, you've, you've done, it's such a good starting point for designing a solution. And as you're saying, you know, you're expanding that problem conversation by having architects as collaborators so that they're constantly giving feedback and allowing the software to to evolve. And I think that's really interesting just for architects to to hear that's how startups work. That's how software companies evolve themselves. Because I speak to so many architects who don't necessarily even think about what the problem is for the clients, for the people that are paying them money. And we talk about charging higher fees and, you know, just just a basic level of foundational efficiency will get your fees right. And you can have a better shot at getting your fees right if you're really clear on what the problem is that you're able to solve for the for the for your clients. And actually, the way we see our product mm -hmm. in the same angle that that you're describing right now about predictability, because if you know that those digital assets exist, and if you know you'd done it in the previous project, you plugged some of them in. You tweaked some of them, but there is a certain amount that you can reference or quickly access. You are better at predicting your fees. Mm -hmm. And you collecting the historical data, maybe attaching in the future this historical data to each individual unit of architectural information and saying, you know, we tracked this detail, take us half an hour. And then almost building this puzzle, not only it's either Excel or drafting software, but almost like intertwining those resources and uh, having a smart look, smart way of integrating them and extracting this data to be more enabled. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, architecture is one of the least, construction in general and architecture is a part of it, one of the five least digitized industries. 
And this is very, you know, hard to wrap your head around that. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Amazing, amazing to, to hear um, everything that you're doing, Natalia. Absolutely fascinating conversation. Perfect place for us to conclude. And I'd like to invite you back on the show maybe in a, in a year's time um, and, and hear how Archie Digital has, has evolved. And, and, uh, and of course, any listeners to the podcast get in contact with, with Natalia and um, get involved. That'd be really, really exciting to hear. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. And uh, thank you for all these insights that you shared as well, because I think what I really like about business of architecture, it always makes me think differently about the knowledge that I had in the past. And it always almost turns your head a little bit and you're like, huh, I didn't think about that. So I hope that the conversation today would be a good addition to, you know, this portfolio of insights that you guys already have. Thank you so much. Amazing. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that's addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.